Presenting the transcription feature, Superman! Look! Up in the sky! It's a bird! It's a plane! It's Superman! Yes, it's Superman! Strange visitor from the planet Krypton, who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Superman, who can leap tall buildings at a single bound, race a speeding bullet to its target, then steal in his bare hands, and who, disguised as Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth and justice. And now to our story. It begins far from the familiar haunts of civilization, far from the streetcars and telephones and electric lights of this modern age. It begins in the deep, snowbound forest of the frozen north, where strong men battle the unyielding elements, so that we may have wood for our ships and our houses, wood for our tables and our toys. The ring of axe blades is sharp and clear, and the lusty cry of timber heralds the crashing to earth of another forest giant. Day in and day out, fair weather and foul, men pour out of logging camps to pit their strength against the mammoth trees that tower above them, afraid of nothing that lives and breathes, afraid of nothing but the mysterious legend of the North Woods. The Legend of the White Plague. Nightfall has come to the Bartlett logging camp on the Big Beaver. The cold, whipping tail of a northeast blizzard lashes at the cluster of cabins. But inside the camp office, the two men who are seated at the broad fireplace find warmth and comfort in the crackling flames. The older of the two raises his iron-gray head. Speak up, Kirsten. What's on your mind? Must be something mighty important to get you out in this kind of weather. It is very important what I've come to say. Well, then, speak up. Sir Harmon, I've come to say that I quit the job. I go back to Quebec. You want to quit? Why? I've got to quit. Because of the white plague. Don't be a superstitious fool, Gaston. I gave you credit for more sense. There's no such thing as the white plague. Oui, oui. She come to Big Beaver. She killed Jacques Dupre and the Swede. She killed me next. Take it easy, Gaston. Dupre stepped into a bear trap, froze to death before we could find him. Svensson killed himself with his own axe in a drunken stupor. No, no, no. The white plague. Listen to me, Gaston. You're one of my best men. I was going to give you a raise in pay next month and let you handle a selling crew. But I can't do it if you go haywire any time something happens in the camp. This is tough work, Gaston, and it takes tough men to handle it. Uh, nowhere in all Northwood is any man tougher than Gaston Lebois. But nothing can stop white plague. I will be next. What you need is a good night's sleep, Gaston. We'll talk it over in the morning, eh? Go on back to your cabin and don't worry. I'll fix everything. But, Monsieur Armand, I tell you, I've got to quit. Okay, we'll take care of that. On the way to your cabin, Gaston, stop off and tell Mr. Dawson I'd like to see him. Good night. Bonsoir. Nancy! Yes, sir? You'd better turn in. I've got something to talk over with Bill Dawson. Has anything gone wrong, Dad? I couldn't help overhearing what Gaston said. It's nothing but logging camp superstition, Nancy. Just because we lost two men in the last week, these ignorant fools think the camp is cursed. We'll scotch it. We'll scotch it fast. I hope nothing else happens. Nothing serious, I mean. You never can tell in this business. But don't you fret about it. Uh, poor kid, you have no right to be stuck up here in the woods a million miles from nowhere. Oh, I don't mind, Dad. I know you don't, but it still isn't right. Well, another month or so, and I'll have enough to set you up in Seattle for at least a year. Oh, but I wouldn't want to leave you here alone, Dad. <laughs> Don't worry about me. Hey, shut that doorbell before we freeze to death. Good evening, Mr. Dawson. You'll excuse me, I've got some sewing to do. Go right ahead, Nancy. Sorry I had to drag you out, Bill. But something important come up. Pull a chair up to the fire. Thanks. Sorry's me now. Not going to let up, either. This fire helps. Gaston was in to see me. I figured as much. He's quitting. Do you know about it? Yeah, Kurt Travers told me. A white plague's got the knuck. Gets them all when the snow comes. Never seen it to fail. We've got to talk him out of it. We've got to convince him this white plague is just so much nonsense. Is it? What do you mean? We rigged up pretty good stories about Dupre and Swenson. How one got caught in a bear trap, how the other did himself in with his axe, but... Nancy, you don't know what really happened. Neither do I, Mr. Harmon. Now, look, Bill. Don't you go back on me. You don't have to worry about me. Well, then, 
Why all this strange talk? Because strange things have been happening. I told you where I found Dupre. In the crotch of a tree. A tree no man could climb without spikes. And he wasn't wearing them. Dead. Yes, I know. I've been logging a long time, Mr. Harmon. I bossed the toughest crew ever to swing axes up in Manitoba. Wherever I've logged, the minute the snow lays deep, there's talk of the White Plague. But you know it's just talk. Sometimes I wonder. When you find a man frozen in the river ice like we found the Swede, I wonder. He was drunk. He fell into the water. I wonder. What was that? Timber wolf. They're getting thick and hungry. Deep snow drives them closer to camps. We'll have to set traps. Now, look, Dawson. You've got to stick by me. We've got a footage schedule. We must meet 50,000 feet of hardwood before December 1st. We can't afford to lose a man now. I know, but if one more peculiar thing happens, they'll beat it out of here like rats from a sinking ship. You can count on that. Well, then it's our job to see that nothing happens. I wish it was as easy as all that. Loggers are a funny lot. They risk their necks every day in the week. But try and get one to walk under a ladder. Or let a black cat cross in front of them, nothing doing. Listen. Well, that wasn't no timber wolf. Listen. Come on, that's a human voice. Where are you going, Dad? Be right back, Nancy. It came from up near those cabins. The wind carried it. Are you sure it wasn't a wolf? Positive. Wolf's howl. That was a scream. I heard it twice. Look, the men are coming out of their cabins. Who's that up ahead? Kirk Travers. He bumps with Gaston. Travers, hold up. Come on, Mr. Harmon. What happened, Travers? Who screamed? Must have been Gaston. Gaston? Yeah, he come into the cabin, took a drink, and then stepped out again. Next thing I heard the scream. Where is he? I don't know. He was right outside the cabin when he let loose with them screams, and now he's gone. Dawson, we've got to find him. We've got to. Mr. Kent, I can't wait to get there. I haven't been able to sleep a wink since we got on the train. How do you ever expect to wield a seven-pound axe if you don't sleep, Jimmy? Oh, they won't let me handle an axe. Is it a real honest-to-goodness logging camp, Mr. Kent? Uh-huh. As real as they make them. Full of logs and lumberjacks. What's the name of it? I don't think it has a name, but it's on the Big Beaver River. Walter Bartlett, a friend of Mr. White, owns it together with a few others further north. Do they know we're coming, Mr. Kent? Oh, of course they do. Mr. Bartlett wired the camp. Jimmy, haven't I answered those questions before? Oh, sure, but I'd just like to hear about it. Why, you little... Ow! <laughs> Cut it out. There is, Clark Kent. Kent. Oh, there's a telegram for you, Mr. Kent. Right here, conductor. Mr. Kent? That's right. And we picked this up at the last stop. Oh, thank you. Gosh, I wonder what it is. Well, we'll find out in a moment. Huh. That's a fine kettle of fish. What is it, Mr. Kent? Who's it from? From Mr. White. Listen to this. Suggest you return. Just heard from camp. Trouble there. Trouble? Yeah. What can he mean? I don't know, but this is a nice time to tell us about it. We get off at the next station. Do we have to go back, Mr. Kent? Yeah, I'm afraid so, Jim. Orders are orders. Oh, hang it all. I knew something would happen. Ah, take it easy, Jim. We may get a chance to visit the camp, at least for a day. There's no train back until late tomorrow. Well, we change for San Marino, Calhoun, Great River. That's our station, Jimmy. Grab your bag. Oh, okay. Hey, you forgot that brand new red and black lumber jacket. Oh, I won't need it now. <laughs> you never can tell. Here, cat. Come on. Oh, it sure is cold out here on the platform. <laughs> You're up north, Jimmy. Say, is that all there is to... What's the name of the place? Montville. It means Mountain City. Is that all there is to it? Those couple of shacks? Yep, that's all. I told you there were no movies or ice cream parlors. Ooh. All right, train stopped. Off you go. And don't slip. Whoop! There we are. What's he yelling for? Nobody got on. <laughs> What's the habit, I guess. All right, come on, Jimmy. Let's see whether we can hire a sled or a dog team and ride out to the camp and say hello. Well, I suppose that's better than nothing. Gosh, wouldn't you know if something would happen? Hello, Edmund! He just keeps saying that one word and cracking his whip at the dogs, Mr. Kent. What's it mean? It means forward or go on. He's telling the dogs to move faster. Is he French? French-Canadian, sort of half and half. Boy, I'm sure glad I wore my lumber jacket. That wind is plenty cold. Yes, seems to be picking up. The man who got this dog sled and driver for us said there might be a blizzard. How far have we got to go? Another five miles. Oh, this is swell fun, Mr. Kelly. Ever! Ever! 
And there he goes again. I guess that's all he knows how to say. He hasn't spoken a word to us since we left. Well, Canucks aren't very talkative. What's he stopping for? I don't know. He's getting something out of his pack. A rifle. Gosh. Uh Uh-oh. I see why he stopped. Look over there. Where? Oh, I see. Gray dogs. No, Jimmy. Timber wolves. Listen to them. Aren't they dangerous, Mr. Kent? Oh, he'll scare them off with a few shots. He's aiming now. Why doesn't he shoot? Sacre bleu. His rifle's jammed. It won't fire. Look, Mr. Kent. The wolves, they're coming closer. Now, don't worry, Jimmy. There must be 50 of them. They're spreading out, circling around. Yes, see, monsieur. Vive, vive. He wants us to get out of the sled, Jimmy. Hurry. She's hiding the dogs behind the sled. What do we do, Mr. Kent? Get down, Jimmy. Down low. To kill two birds with one stone, Clark Kent planned a well-earned vacation at a logging camp deep in the North Woods, where he hoped to gather material for a story. Jimmy Olsen was accompanying him. However, less than five minutes before their train arrived at the town nearest the camp, Kent received a telegram from his editor, Perry White, telling him to return because of trouble at the camp. Since there was no southbound train until the following evening, Kent and Jimmy hired a dog sled and a driver and started for the logging camp just to pay it a visit. En route, a pack of lean, hungry wolves attacked the sled and circled it, howling ravenously. Get down, Jimmy. Crouch down low. There's no room behind the sled. The driver's got the dogs huddled there. What's he going to do, Mr. Kent? Trying to get his rifle to work. It's jammed. I get the chills just listening to them howl. Look at that one. He's creeping in close on his belly. And they're after the dogs. That's what they want. Well, they don't look very choosy. Why doesn't that driver say something or do something? There's nothing he can do unless that gun of his gets working. Look out, that wolf. He's after the dogs. Get out! Oh. He chased him back. Oh, but not far enough. Do, do we have these people, Mr. Kent? I don't think so. But... But you're not sure. Now, don't you worry, Jimmy. I'm not worried. I'm a little nervous. They're all crawling on their bellies now. Look at their teeth. He's not going to get that gun fixed in time. I know he's not. Flip your head, Jimmy. You've got work to do. I'm going to send you and the driver on to the logging camp. What do you mean? I'll keep the wolves here with that big juicy steak we were taking out as a gift for Mr. Hart and the camp boss. They won't leave with a smell of fresh meat around. Here. This must be the package. Ah, yeah. Now, climb back into the sled. No, I won't go without you. Do as I say. Driver, oh, get in the sled. Drive to camp. Fast. Comprende? Oui. Oui. All right. Off you go. Mr. Kent, please. Please. Oh, oh. Oh. Let's see whether this slab of meat will hold them. There we are. Now, take a look at this, you beggars. Get a good whip. That's working. They're not following the sled. It's out of sight now. Superman can take over. All right, go ahead. Hold your heads off. I've never tackled 50 wolves before, but this is always the first time. Come and get it. Nice, juicy beef steak. Ha, <laughs> like the looks of it, don't you? Come on, a little closer. A little more. That's it. Now. Oh, no, you don't. Well, finish. Yeah, that does it. Well, that's one. Now for the rest. Oh, getting ready to charge me all at once, eh? Okay, I'm waiting. I'm ready for you. Come on. Three. Four of you. Five. Come on, keep coming. Seven. Are you sure you won't have a hot cup of milk, Jimmy? No, thanks, Miss Harmon. Now, look, Jimmy, you mustn't eat your heart out worrying. My father's gone to look for Mr. Kent with some of his best men. Buck up. Well, they'll never find him. There were 50 wolves. Oh, I'm sure there couldn't have been that many. But I tell you, there were. They were in a circle. Mr. Kent stood there holding up the piece of meat. I could see them coming in closer to get it. Jimmy, please. <laughs> Crying won't help. You're much too big a boy to cry. <laughs> you cried, too, if you had a friend like Mr. Kent. You knew you were never going to see him again. <laughs> Who could that be? How do you do? Mr. Kent. Hello, Jim. Won't you come in? Thank you. Mr. Kent, they didn't... They didn't... They didn't eat me, if that's what you're trying to say. I told Jimmy there weren't 50 in the pack, and that they rarely attack humans. I'm Nancy Harmon, and I assume you're Mr. Kent. But there were 50, maybe more. Isn't that right, Mr. Kent? Uh, More or less. I'm glad to meet you, Miss Harmon. Jimmy, have you been crying? Oh, no. His eyes are just inflamed from the snow. Oh, I see. Where did my father pick you up, Mr. Kent? Uh, Your father? Yes. 
When the dog sled pulled in and Jimmy told us what had happened, Dad and two of his men went out after you. Oh, well, uh, I guess I missed them. Well, how'd you get here? Oh, I, I walked. They tell some tall stories in the North Woods, Mr. Kent, but I think you can go them one better. Paul Bunyan couldn't have walked five miles that fast, and they say each step he took measured a hundred yards. Gosh, just like Superman. And who is Superman? <laughs> Some unbelievable pal of Jimmy's who can fly through the air with the greatest of ease. I'm sorry I missed your father, Miss Harmon. He should be back shortly. Will you have something hot to drink? No, thanks. Uh, I'll take that milk and cake now, if you've still got it. <laughs> of course I have. Be right back. Oh, I'm sure glad to see you, Mr. Kent. How'd you ever get away from those wolves? Well, they preferred beefsteak to Clark Kent, that's all. Can't say that I blame them. No, you did get here awful fast. Well, I must have taken a shortcut. Here you are, Jimmy. Chocolate cake and milk. Mm, thanks a lot. Won't you sit down, Mr. Kent? No. Oh. Take Dad's chair near the fire. It's very comfortable. Uh, it sure is. Well, I suppose Jimmy told you what brought us here. Yes. You see, Dad thought it best to wire Mr. Bartlett and tell you not to come. Because we've been having a little trouble in camp. What sort of trouble? Well, I don't like to talk about it, but it's quite serious. Perhaps I can help. Very kind of you, but I'm afraid there's nothing you can do. Oh, I'm sorry our wire didn't reach you in time. Oh, that's quite all right. Jimmy and I enjoyed the train ride, didn't we, Jim? Mm, mm-hmm. Mm. <laughs> that was the chocolate cake talking. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, though, Miss Harmon, are you sure I can't be of any assistance? I don't think so. You see, Mr. Kent, logging camps are strange places. What do you mean? Well, oh, I guess I might just as well tell you. I'm not supposed to know exactly what's happened, but I do. We've had some mysterious... I suppose you'd call them accidents at the camp, Mr. Kent. Accidents? Yes, in a way. We've lost three men in a little over a week. I don't quite understand. You mean three men left the camp? No. No, they were found dead. At least two of them were. The third hasn't been located since the night before last. That's when Dad wired Mr. Bartlett to tell you not to come. I'm sorry to have to admit this, Miss Harmon, but I still don't understand. Two men were found dead and a third is missing? Uh, were these men murdered? No, or... that's just it. We don't know. Now, please, Mr. Kent, when you meet Dad, don't let on that I've told you all this. Well, you really haven't told me anything yet. Well, I'm coming to the important part. Oh, well, then go on, Miss Harmon. Well, about a week ago, one of our French-Canadian loggers disappeared into thin air. His name was Jacques Dupre. He just vanished like a puff of smoke. Gosh. Searching party combed the woods for him. And the logging boss, Bill Dawson, finally found him. Frozen to death up in the crotch of a tall tree. A tree he couldn't possibly have climbed without spikes. And he had no spikes on. Oh, well, how'd he get up there? Jimmy. That's what puzzled everyone. How did he get up there? Of course, Dad and Mr. Dawson didn't tell the men where he'd been found. They made up some sort of a story, but the men knew. What happened to the second man? He vanished, too, the following night. What? He was a big Swedish logger, strong as an ox. Mr. Dawson found him frozen in the river ice. Jimmy, frozen solid? Jimmy, you must keep quiet. You said something about a third man, Miss Harmon. Yes. Gaston, another French-Canadian... He came in the night before last to talk to Dad. Yes? He wanted to quit because of the white plague. The what? Well, loggers have a strange superstition, Mr. Kent. They believe that when the snow is deep enough to cover all the roots of a tree and the bottom of the trunk, that no tree should be cut down. They think it's nature's way of protecting the tree until spring, and no man has a right to go against nature. Hmm, that's very curious. I've never heard it before. <laughs> of course, it's silly, but some loggers will swear that if trees are felled when snow covers the roots, the White Plague visits the camp. What is the White Plague? What does it do? They say it punishes men who go against nature. Oh, I see. And Gaston wanted to quit because he was afraid of the White Plague, the plague that had carried off the first two loggers. That's right. Well, Dad told him to get a good night's sleep, and he left. Mr. Dawson came in, and Dad was chatting with him when suddenly someone screamed outside. Dad and Mr. Dawson rushed out. It was a bad blizzard. What do you think they found? Oh, what? Jimmy. They found Gaston had vanished from sight in front of his cabin. And he hasn't been found since. Oh, gosh. That gives me the creeps. Oh, I suppose all the loggers want to quit. Yes, and it's terrible because we've been cutting wood for the government and it's needed badly. Dad's been out of his mind for days. Mm, you said you had trouble, Miss Harmon. You put it mildly. And what does the logging boss, Mr. Dawson, say about all this? Well, he's sticking by Dad, naturally, but I have a funny feeling he believes there's something to this white plague business. The other night, I heard him say he wonders about it. And what do you think? I don't know. First, well, I thought it was just silly superstition, like breaking a mirror or spilling salt, but now, now I'm puzzled. It's like being in a dark room and 
knowing that nobody else is in the room with you, and that feeling that you're not alone. I guess that doesn't sound very sensible. Well, you mean like a ghost? Don't be silly, Jimmy. You know there's no such thing as a ghost. So, Miss Harmon, you really feel there may be something to the white plague? Oh, no. It... Oh, I'm sure it's just nonsense, but when things keep happening, strange things, it sort of gets you. Yes, I understand. I'm not afraid or anything, but... What's that? Someone's at the door. Come in! That's funny. Here, wait. You better let me open the door. Be careful, Mr. Kent. Why, it's a man on the verge of collapse. Doctor! Catch him, Mr. Kent! I got him. Close the door, Jimmy. All right. Put him on the couch. All right. Here we are. He's blue with cold. I'll get some brandy. Rub his wrist. Mr. Kent, is he alive? Uh, bring me that blanket, Jimmy. All right. This one? Yes. That's it. Thanks. Here's the brandy, Mr. Kent. I'm afraid it won't do any good, Miss Harmon. You mean... Yes. He just drew his last breath. Mystery piled on mystery. Where did Gaston return from? So exhausted that death reached him almost as his frozen knuckles wrapped against the door. Did the strange secret of the White Plague die on his lips? This is only the beginning of an Northwoods adventure more gripping than anything you have ever heard before. Don't miss even one thrilling episode. Don't forget, tune in again for the next thrilling episode with Superman. Arriving at the Bartlett logging camp deep in the North Woods, Clark Kent and young Jimmy Olsen have run into a baffling mystery. They found the camp under the spell of a strange superstition, a superstition of the frozen north, a belief that whoever cuts down a tree whose roots are covered with snow will suffer the vengeance of the White Plague. Thus far, two lumberjacks have been found dead under curious circumstances, and a third, after vanishing into thin air, staggered back to the office of the camp boss only to draw his last breath before he could utter a word. At the moment, a dangerous undercurrent of fear is running through the camp, the loggers go about their work uneasily, waiting and wondering where the white plague will strike next. Fred Harmon, boss of the camp, is beside himself with anxiety, and his daughter Nancy is suffering because of her father's state of mind. Bill Dawson, tough, broad-shouldered boss of the logging crew, is driving his men on despite their unrest. We find Dawson, together with Kent and Jimmy, some miles from the camp, watching a crew of a dozen burly lumberjacks chop their way through a stand of towering oak. The ring of axe blades against live wood is sharp and clear on the frosty air. Gosh, look at those chips fly, Mr. Kent. They certainly can swing those axes. They sure can, Jimmy. How long does it take to chop through one of those oaks, Mr. Dawson? Two good men can fill a three-foot trunk in eight to ten minutes. Look, that big one's beginning to sway. Watch. See? Boy, look at that. All right, week 17. Must be pretty near time to knock off for lunch. I'll tell the men. Be back in a minute. All right. Well, Jimmy, what do you think of logging? Oh, it's exciting, all right, but I don't know... You don't know what? Well, I don't know whether I'd be keen on doing it for a living. Oh, it's too cold. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't be cold if you were swinging one of those 10-pound double-edged axes. Look at that short, dark man over there, the one in the green shirt. He's actually perspiring. I know, but doesn't it ever get warm up here? Oh, I imagine it's warm in the summertime. Well, Mr. Kent, why do they yell timber every time a tree falls? Well, for the same reason they yell four in a golf game before they hit the ball. It's to warn everyone in the way that a tree is about to topple. Otherwise, some logger who happens to have his back turned might be hurt when the tree crashes down. Oh, did you say hurt? Mm -hmm. Gosh, if one of those trees ever fell on a man, he'd end up in China. Yes, it's a dangerous business, Jimmy. But a very important one. Look at that big oak, the one they just felled. Do you know how old it is? Mm, about ten years. Oh, that tree, Jimmy, must be 300 years old if it's a day. What? Are you kidding, Mr. Kent? No. Oaks grow very slowly, and that size tree probably was an acorn long before George Washington was born. Gosh, I never knew trees lived that long. Oh, there are some trees, mahogany and teak, that are estimated to be a thousand years old. Well, how is it then that the forests aren't overgrown with trees? Hmm? How is it that before people started to cut them down, the whole world wasn't just a lot of trees? Well, most of the world consisted of trees and bushes before the Ice Age, Jimmy. Oh. Well, what was the Ice Age? Well, that was a time thousands of years ago when great layers of ice slid down from the north and covered many of the forests and killed the trees off. That's the reason we have coal. Oh, what's coal got to do with it? You mean the kind of coal you burn in a stove? Uh-huh. 
Oh, now, wait a minute, Mr. Kent. Miners dig that out of the ground. Well, that's right, but that same coal the miners dig used to be the trees that were buried under the ice. Huh? Well, you see, Jim, the weight of the ice forced the wood together, and a chemical change came over it because it was buried so deep, and it turned into coal. Honest, Mr. Kent? Uh Uh-huh. As a matter of fact, in Arizona, there's a place called the Petrified Forest. There, the trees either weren't buried deep enough, or there wasn't sufficient pressure, and instead of turning into coal, they turned into stone. If we ever have to take a trip out west, we'll stop by and see it. Mm, strange how much you don't know, Mr. Kent. How much I don't know? No, I mean how much everyone doesn't know. Oh. For instance, something like this, how trees turned into coal. I'll bet not one kid back in Metropolis knows that. Oh, I'm sure there are plenty of them who do. Oh, you wait and see. When I get back, I'll ask them. Chances are even their fathers don't know. And take a kid like Skinny Walsh. His pops are motorman on the streetcar line. And I'll wager even he doesn't know. <laughs> We can all learn a lot of things day in and day out, Jimmy. Ours is a wonderful country. If more of us got to know it better, we'd learn to appreciate it. The Grand Canyon, the Rocky Mountains, the Mississippi River. No country in the world has so much to offer. Oh, here comes Mr. Dawson. I hope that basket he's carrying has our lunch in it. I could eat a bear. <laughs> You'd have to catch him first, and that might spoil your appetite. Sorry, I kept you waiting so long, but the men ate themselves today. I had to perk them up a little. How about putting on the feed bag? Oh, that's all I've been waiting to hear. <laughs> well, there's plenty of it. When Nancy Harmon sets up a lunch, nobody goes hungry. She set this one up special. Venison sandwich, son? Oh, what's venison? Deer meat, Jimmy. Oh. Well, gee, I don't know. Yeah, I... you said you could eat a bear. It's tender as chicken. Okay, I'll try it. <laughs> Mr. Kent? Thanks. Well, Jimmy, like it? Mmm. Mmm, it's swell. Mm-hmm. It certainly is. You have fresh meat up here all winter, Mr. Dawson? Mm-hmm. We try to. It was to be had. Mm-hmm. Living on salt pork and jerk beef for a spell makes you relish a piece of fresh meat. <laughs> hey, chew it, Jimmy. This isn't a race to see who can get the sandwich down first. Oh, the boy's hungry. This air is what does it. Say, I, uh, I haven't had a chance to ask you, Mr. Dawson, and I hope you don't mind my bringing it up. Uh, but uh, what do you think about this white plague business? I try not to think about it, Kent. Well, I can appreciate that, but there must be some explanation for all that's happened. That French-Canadian, Gaston, where was he for two days and two nights? He certainly couldn't have lived through that blizzard out in the open. It don't seem likely, does it? Yet he was alive when he staggered to the door of the camp office. Didn't speak a word, did he? No. I put him on the couch while Miss Harmon went for some brandy. By the time she got back, he was dead. Too bad he couldn't have told what happened. It is too bad, because that might have explained everything. Of course, I know you don't believe the white plague superstition. If you did, you wouldn't have let the men cut those trees this morning. That uh, last one, for instance, had snow piled around the trunk three feet high. Another sandwich, son? Well, if there is one. There are plenty of them. Thanks, Mr. Dawson. There are only two possible solutions to the mystery, Dawson. Either the deaths were accidental, or... Or what? Or someone's trying to throw a scare into the camp, for one reason or another. Could it be any of your men? That don't make sense, Mr. Kent. They earn their living logging. Say, what's that man running taught us for? Something's wrong. Kurt Travers never ran a step in his life unless he was being chased. What is it, Travers? You better come, Mr. Dawson. What happened? You'll see. The men are all gathered around a tree stump. No, Jimmy, you stay here. Oh, gee, I... I said stay here. Is this a joke, Travers? No, it ain't no joke. All right, stand back. Look, one of your men doubled up on the ground. Sam Green. He's stone dead. It's a white flag, that's what it is. Shut up. How'd this happen, Driver? I don't know. He was sitting on the stump eating when suddenly he keeled over. It was him and me fell that last tree. Ah, the white flag's got him. I'll floor the next man who opens his mouth about the white flag. Sam had a heart attack. He was strong as an ox. Well, then maybe a rattler bit him. Sure, sure, that's what it is. Rattler struck him on the calf right above the top of his boot. All right, break it up. Ken, give me a hand, will you? Sure. Carry him back to the chuck sled. Yep. Come on. There we are. That's it. Gosh, Mr. Kent, what happened? Get out of the way, Jimmy. Is he sick? There we are. Okay, Ken. Up on the sled. Okay. I'll cover him with this blanket. All right. I think you and the boy had better drive right back to camp. I'll stick around and talk to the man. Sure, all right. Will I be able to find the camp? You can't miss it. It's the logging trail, and the snow's packed hard. Oh. The horse will lead you. He's pulled that chuck sled over the trail a hundred times. I'll hitch him up. What's Good. the matter with the man, Mr. Kent? I, he, uh, he had a heart attack. Gosh. Is he... Is he... Yes. Oh, gosh. 
All set, Mr. Kent. All right, come on, Jimmy. When you get to camp, Mr. Kent, drive around back to the office. Yes, I will. All right, Jimmy, up on the seat. All right. Just follow the trail and keep it a walk, or old John will slip. Okay. Get up. Gosh, Mr. Kent, do you think this will make things worse? What do you mean, Jim? Well, about the, the white plague. Oh, I'm surprised at you, Jimmy. Oh, I don't believe all that stuff about the white plague, Mr. Kent. It does seem funny. What seems funny? Well, that fellow was the one in the green shirt, the one who was perspiring. Yes. Remember that last big tree that was cut down just before the men knocked off for lunch? What are you driving at? That fellow in the green shirt was the one who chopped that big tree down. And it was the only tree that had a snowdrift around the bottom of the trunk. Oh, now, don't let your imagination run away with you, Jimmy. Two men were working on that tree, and one of them is still perfectly all right. You can't tell. Now, what sort of sense does that make? You can't tell. I mean, something might happen to him yet. You certainly are cheerful about it. This is going to be terrible for poor Mr. Harmon and Nancy. Gosh, I hate to think of it. Well, then don't. How can I help it? Last night, that French-Canadian came stumbling in. I know all about it, Jimmy. Is there anything else you can discuss? The weather or the price of beans? All right. Now, you don't have to sulk. The only reason I don't want you to talk about it is that I think we're going to solve the mystery. You mean the mystery of the white plague? That's right. Do you know what it is? Now, take it easy. No, I don't know what it is, but... What, what was that? Drop down, Jimmy. Drop down. Someone's shooting at us with a rifle. Hold it. Hold it. Oh, oh, oh. Where's it coming from, Mr. Kent? From those woods over there to the right. Keep low and behind me. I heard that bullet whiz by. I can't see anyone. The horse is getting nervous. We better make a run for it. Stay down, Jim. Be careful, Mr. Kent. Get up. Come on, get up. Get up. Breaking into a gallop, the frightened horse drags the careening sled over the hard-packed trail. A steel-jacketed bullet sing around Kent's ears. Who is shooting at them? And how is it that Kent, even with his amazing vision, is unable to see the killer? The mystery is deepening, so don't miss a single thrilling episode. Don't forget, tune in again for the next thrilling episode with Superman. Things have taken a serious turn at the Bartlett logging camp deep in the North Woods, where Clark Kent and young Jimmy Olsen are involved in a baffling mystery. Not only have four lumberjacks met death at unknown hands, but the legend of the White Plague, said to be responsible for the death, now seems to be seeking vengeance from Kent and Jimmy. When we last saw them, they were driving a horse-drawn sled back to the camp, a sled carrying the lifeless body of a lumberjack, who had suddenly and mysteriously collapsed. Without warning, a rifle began blazing at them from the woods adjoining the trail. Shouting to Jimmy to keep low, Kent sent the horse into a gallop as steel-jacketed bullets whined about his head. Stay down, Jimmy. Whoever's handling that rifle means business. Get up, boy. Be careful, Mr. Kent. You get hit. Don't worry about me. Stop shooting. Yeah, but keep low until we get around this bend. There. Okay, I guess we can pull up. Whoa, boy. Whoa, there. Whoa. There. That's a close call. Who do you think it was, Mr. Kent? I don't know, Jimmy. But if they think we're going to take this lying down, they're crazy. They can believe that the white plague kills off people mysteriously if they want to, but the white plague doesn't shoot a high-powered rifle. You know, I'd almost swear that a couple of those bullets bounced off your back. Oh, now look here, Jimmy. Well, I admit it's impossible, but that's how it seems. Every time there was a shot, I heard the bullet whiz by. Every time except twice. Then there was a little thump, and he sort of stiffened up and... Oh, forget it. I'm just nuts. I'm beginning to think so. Well, what do we do now? No sense sitting here. We might just as well go on to the camp. I'd like to sneak back and see if I can find some trace of whoever was shooting at us. Oh, and let him have another shot at you? I know you've got a lot of courage and all that, but good grief, you're not Superman. Oh, no? I mean... Oh, no, no, of course not. Well, let's head for the camp, but don't mention this shooting incident to anyone, Jimmy. And not even to Mr. Harmon? Not even to Mr. Harmon. He has plenty to worry about as it is. Let's keep it quiet for a while. Okay. Get up, boy. Come on. Get up. Get up. Oh, that fire sure feels good after spending most of the day watching your men chop trees, Mr. Harmon. Yes, I suppose it does. Kent, I'm at the end of my rope. This last thing, Sam Green's death, is all I can stand. I'm riding into town tonight to wire Mr. Bartlett that I'm closing up. You can't do that, Mr. Harmon. That's quitting in the face of a little trouble. You call this a little trouble? 
Four men dead under strange circumstances and every human being in the camp in deadly fear that he'll be next? You call that a little trouble? Well, I admit it's puzzling, but there must be a solution. This nonsense about the white plague seeking vengeance on your men because they've been cutting trees with snow-covered roots is so much childish superstition. Yes, I know. But you can't convince the men of that. Some of them are getting ready to leave now. What does Dawson say? What can he say? Bill doesn't believe it any more than you or I do, but he's helpless. Matter of fact, you and young Jimmy have no right staying here. What if something happened to either one of you? Oh, nothing's going to happen to us. By the way, where is Jimmy? Well, Nancy took him out back to show him the baby raccoon she penned up. Oh. Come in. Oh, it's you, Olaf. Yeah, I bring back life from Mr. Harmon. All right, just set it in the corner with the others, Olaf. Thank you. And uh, if you see Mr. Dawson, Olaf, ask him to step in. Yeah, Mr. Harmon, I do. Was he one of the felling crew Dawson had out this morning, Mr. Harmon? The crew Sam Green was with? Yes. Where did he get the rifle? Why, each crew takes one along in case of wolves or bears. And that rifle went along with Dawson's crew? Now, I'm sorry, Kent, but frankly, I'm in no state of mind to answer unimportant questions. What difference does it make what rifle went with what crew? Haven't we more important things to think about? I wonder. Where are you going, Kent? Which of these rifles did that Swede just return? Uh, well, the one on the right. This one? Yes. Uh, here, smell this barrel. Burnt powder. This rifle's been shot recently. Well, what of it? Is there any law against firing a rifle? Yes, if you fire it at human beings. What are you talking about, Kent? Well, I hadn't intended telling you this for fear of worrying you further, but someone tried to kill Jimmy and myself today, Mr. Harmon. What? But Kent, you don't mean that. I'm afraid I do. When we were driving the sled back to camp, someone fired at us from the woods with a rifle. This rifle. Someone fired at you? Yes, quite a number of shots. But why, Kent? Well, that's not important at the moment. What is important is that this rifle was used to fire the shots. Well, you can't be sure of that. We have four rifles in camp, all of them the same make. They may have all been fired today. At wolves. Well, we can find out, can't we? The crew Jimmy and I were with had no reason for using a rifle. That is, up to the time we left. Suppose you call that Swedish logger back. He should know whether the rifle was used. It's a good idea, Ken. I'll put my Mackinac on and get him. This is simply terrible. I'll be right back. I wonder whether the person who used this rifle was smart enough to reload it. No, only one way to find out. Hmm. There's a brand new full five-shot clip in here. He was smart enough. But he didn't bother to clean the barrel, and that's what may hang all this on him. Well, you didn't waste any time, Mr. Harmon. Well, there isn't any to waste. Olaf... This is Mr. Kent. Aben, uh, glad to meet you, Mr. Kent. How do you do, Olaf? That's the rifle you just returned, isn't it, Olaf? The one Mr. Kent is holding? Yeah, I, I think so. It's the one you brought back a few minutes ago and placed in the corner? Uh, yeah, yeah. Was that rifle used today, Olaf? You mean was shot, Mr. Harmon? Yes, I mean shot. Oh, no, that's the rifle she know was shot today. No, no. Are you sure, Olaf? Aben, sure. Used like Aben, sure. My name, Olaf Johnson. Nobody shot this rifle? Yeah. You mean somebody did shoot it? Oh, no, no. You, you got me twisted, Mr. Harmon. Uh, Kent, hmm? you'd better take over. I I can't even think straight. Olaf, you say the rifle wasn't shot all day. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you know it wasn't shot? Where was it? Leaning on the stump. I even see it 20 times, maybe. I understand. You saw the rifle leaning against the stump. All right, but someone might have picked it up and shot it. No, no. Did you hear any rifle shots this afternoon? Yeah. Oh, but you're sure they didn't come from this gun? Yeah. Huh. Well, Mr. Harmon, either he's lying or he's mistaken. Oh, Olaf, never lie. What do you mean when you say that? Now, say, take it easy, old. Mr. Kent didn't say that you lied. Yeah, I've been here. He may know us deaf. I punch him in his nose. I'm sorry, Olaf. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. I hurt your face with punching nose if you say, Olaf, tell lie. All right, Olaf, all right. You can go now. And Olaf say rifle no shot. Rifle no shot. Ain't no tell lie. 
Well, I always knew Swedes were sensitive, but not that sensitive. Well, now what, Kent? Looks like we're up against a blank wall again. While you were getting Olaf, I examined the rifle, Mr. Harmon. Whoever used it took the precaution of reloading it with a new clip of cartridges. That convinces me this was the gun employed. Well, assuming that it is, what good does that knowledge do us unless we know who pulled the trigger? Oh, I wish Dawson had get here. Maybe he knows the answer to this. Well, didn't he come back with the crew? Yes, but an ice jam developed on the river. He went down to blow it out. Oh. We're due to float 10,000 feet downstream tonight because it must reach the mill by next week. Well, he should be back shortly. Kent, I don't think I can stand much more of this. Oh, now, buck up, Mr. Harmon. It'll straighten out. I suppose so. In the meantime, I... I can't take it. I'm not as young as I'd like to be when trouble starts brewing. I've had my share of it all my life and managed to squeeze by, but when you're going on 55, Kent, you feel as though you've got a right to sit back, relax. Well, you'll get that chance, I'm sure. I'm worried about Nancy, Kent. When I take things hard, it upsets her terribly. I know she hasn't slept a wink these last few nights. I hear her get up, come out, and sit by the fire. It's not right. Oh. Hey, by the way, where are Jimmy and Nancy? I didn't realize it, but it's almost dark. Why, I told you, they went out to look at the raccoons. Yes, but that was almost an hour ago. Where are the raccoons? The wire pen, out and back. Here, this way. Yeah, there's the pen, next to that shed. Well, I don't see either of them. Jimmy! They may have walked down around the cabins. And she knows my whistle. She'll answer it. That's funny. I'm going to look for them. It'll be pitch dark soon. Now, wait a minute, Kent. Look at these footprints in the snow around the pen. One set is Nancy's, and the other set must be Jimmy's. Yes, it is. We can follow them. Come on. Where do they lead to? Back of the shed. What there? Nothing but a little cleared land. Then a pine woods. Well, the prints are headed right for the woods. I don't like this, Kent. Nancy would never wander away like this. Wait a minute. Hold up. All right. What is it, Kent? Look. They never got to the woods. The footprints end here, right out in the open. No, they... They must have gone back or turned off. Those are the only footprints in the snow besides our own. But, Kent, it's impossible. They couldn't just vanish. Where could they have gone? And according to these footprints, there's only one place they could have gone. Up in the air. Now, what strange, baffling thing has happened to add to the mystery surrounding the logging camp? Where did Jimmy and Nancy Harmon vanish to, and how is it possible that their footprints in the snow ended abruptly? Can you figure it out? If you can't, don't fail to listen to the next episode of Superman. Don't forget, tune in again for the next thrilling episode with Superman. The legend of the White Plague, a strange superstition of the frozen north, has been terrorizing the Bartlett logging camp where Clark Kent and young Jimmy Olsen are vacationing. When we last saw Kent, he and Fred Harmon, middle-aged boss of the camp, were alone in the camp office. Suddenly, Kent realized it was getting dark and wondered what had happened to Harmon's daughter, Nancy, and Jimmy Olsen, both of whom had gone out to look at some young raccoons penned up behind the cabin. Kent investigated but found no sign of them. However, their footprints were clearly visible in the snow and seemed to point in the direction of a pine forest about a quarter of a mile behind the logging camp. Puzzled and worried, Kent and Harmon followed the footprints until they suddenly and mysteriously stopped halfway between the camp and the forest. For a moment, both men were speechless. Then Kent said, Look, Mr. Harmon, they never got to the woods. These footprints end abruptly right out here in the open. But it's impossible, Kent. They must have gone back or turned off and walked in another direction. But those are the only footprints in the snow besides our own. But Kent, it's fantastic. Nancy and Jimmy couldn't just vanish. Where did they go? Well, according to these footprints, there's only one place they could have gone. Up in the air. Kent, please, this is no time for jokes. In another ten minutes, it'll be pitch dark. Nancy! Nancy! We'd better go back to camp, Mr. Harmon. Check all the cabins. Jimmy has an insatiable curiosity, and he might have talked Nancy into taking him on a tour of inspection. I'll look through the pine woods. Wait a minute. Someone's coming. Oh, it's you, Dawson. Hey, Kent. Something wrong? Plenty, Dawson. Nancy and Kent's boy, Jimmy, have disappeared. Why? Oh, I think they've just wandered off, Mr. Dawson. Probably find them in one of the loggers' cabins chewing the fat. I wish I was that optimistic. Look at those footprints in the snow, Dawson. They're Nancy's and Jimmy's. See how they stopped short? Oh, no back tracks? No, they didn't turn back. That's funny. Tracks got to lead somewhere. That's what frightens me. They don't. Now, look, Mr. Harmon, you mustn't let go. 
I'm just as concerned as you are, but we'll find them. You and Dawson check the cabins. I'll search the woods. No man in his right mind goes into them woods alone after dark, Mr. Kent. Not with the wolves hungry as they are. The wolves don't bother me. You check the cabins. And if you locate them, give me a shout. Hold up, Kent. Don't go in there alone. I'd better go with them, Mr. Harmon. You route the men out and have them search the east woods in pairs. I'll go along with Kent. All right. All right. Hold up, Kent. I'm coming with you. Don't worry too much about me, Dawson. Uh, you don't know the north woods during a bad winter, Mr. Kent. Even a hungry fox will charge a man. Come on. What do you make of all this, Dawson? I don't know. Don't seem human. Oh, it's human, all right. I didn't tell you, but Jimmy and I came close to losing our lives when we drove that sled back to camp today. Why? Someone fired at us from the woods. That was human, all right. That much you can count on. Legends, even important ones like the White Plague, can't pull the trigger of a high-powered rifle. You mean someone actually shot at you and the boy trying to hit you? That's just what I mean. And the rifle he used was the same one your logging crew took along on the job today. Now, just a minute, Kent. If you're insinuating that one of my I'm not insinuating anything, Mr. Dawson. I'm stating cold facts. Well, since you know what rifle was used, maybe you know who used it. No, I don't. At least at the moment. But I'll find out, Dawson, if I have to stay here until the snow melts. Ah, well, here we are at the edge of the woods. You see any tracks? I don't want. They're not in the woods, Kent. Nancy knew better than to go into that thick pine at night. Jimmy! 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 That can be heard for over a mile. If there's no answer... Wait a minute. I thought I heard something moving through the brush. Woodchuck, likely. That pine's full of them. Jimmy! Miss Harmon! Miss Harmon! What was that? It sounded like shots. Rifle from the camp. Come on, let's beat it back. Uh, who do you think shooting? Colonel, cut back to the office, Kent. All right. There's a deep snow drift on the other uh, side. Follow me. Right. Wait a minute. What? There's someone standing near the raccoon pen. He's carrying a rifle. Who's there? It's me. Red Harmon. Oh. oh. I missed it. I'm sure I missed it. You missed what, Mr. Harmon? I heard its wings beating. What? I rushed in for a rifle, and by the time I came out again, I could barely see it. What are you talking about, Mr. Harmon? It was like an eagle, Ken, only bigger. A white eagle. I think you'd better go inside, Mr. Harmon. No, no, wait. If I come back. I shot at it twice, but I'm sure I missed it. Take his other arm, Ken. Let go of me. You think I'm mad, don't you? Well, I'm not. I saw it as clearly as I see you, and I heard its wings. It was big enough to lift a man from the ground. Do you hear Big enough to lift the man. Please, Mr. Harmon. I know it sounds mad, but believe me, it's the truth. Look. What's that sticking up on the snowbank? No. Over there. Why, it's a feather. A large white feather. Oh, you'll see. Now, do you believe me? Let me see it, Kent. Here. It's a feather, all right. And look at the size of it. Look at it. Too big for an eagle feather, even a tail quill. I told you, it had a ten-foot wing spread. It was big enough to carry a man off. Kent, do you know what that means? Got a crack any minute now, Dawson. Take him into his cabin. I'll be right back. It means, Kent, that Nancy and Jimmy were carried off someplace. I know what it means. That Superman has to step in. I'm sure Harmon must be mistaken, but I can't take any chances. If there is a bird that big up in the sky, I'll find it. Up! Up! And away! Drink this brandy, Mr. Harmon. It'll make you feel better. No, I don't want it. Where did Kent go, Dawson? I don't know. He said he'd be back. Dawson, those footprints in the snow, Nancy's and Jimmy's. Remember how they ended abruptly? Remember? Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Here, yeah, take this brandy, Mr. Harmon. Dawson, send a man into town. I want to wire Mr. Bartlett. We're closing the camp, Dawson. I can't stand it any longer. All right, I'll send a man in. Here, drink this. Uh, that'll make you feel better. What time is it, Dawson? I don't know, Mr. Harmon. I haven't got my watch. There's a clock in the back room. Bring it in here. Okay. There. All right, put it on the table. What time is it? 8.15. It's dark out, isn't it? Pitch dark. Yeah. Nancy and the boy are out there in the darkness. 
We may never see them again, Dawson. Never. No sign of any giant bird yet. I know this is all a waste of precious time, but I've got to satisfy myself that Harmon was just mad with anxiety. And yet his story of the bird and those footprints in the snow match perfectly. Wait. What's that down below me in a forest clearing? Smoke pouring out of a chimney. That's strange. Dawson told me there wasn't a human being within five miles of the camp. I think I'll drop down and investigate. Down! Down! It's a log cabin. No light inside, but there must be a fire burning. Might as well look into it as Clark Kent. It doesn't look like there's anyone home. I wonder whether the door's locked. No, it's open. Hello, is anyone in? Guess not. Wait. Someone stretched out on a cot. What? Why, it's Nancy Harmon. And there's Jimmy on another cot. See now. And they're both breathing evenly. And they're not hurt. Seem to be asleep. Jimmy. Jimmy, wake up. Nothing doing. I know what's the matter. They've been drugged. I'd better get them back to camp as soon as possible. I'll have to fly with Superman. All right. Here we are. One under each arm. Out the door. Up! Up! And away! What time is it, Dawson? You just asked me, Mr. Harmon, 9.25. Kent hasn't come back yet? No. You send a man into town to get that wire off, Dawson? Not yet. Well, why not? What are you waiting for? I think we'd better wait until Mr. Kent gets back. Why? Well, I don't know, but... What was that wind? Is there a storm coming up? I don't think so. Take a look outside. Okay. Hold the door open, Dawson. Here, found him, Kent. Nancy! Nancy! Take it easy, Mr. Harmon. Here, give me a hand with you, Dawson. Yeah, sure. Put Nancy on the couch. That's it. This settee here is big enough for Jimmy. There you go, young fella. Yeah, that's fine. Kent. They're dead. No, no, they're not. No, sir. Where's the nearest doctor, Dawson? At Hart's Landing. That's 50 miles. What? But what's the matter with them, Kent? Were they hurt? No, no. They they, they won't hurt. They, they're all right. They, they seem to have been drugged. No doctor nearer than Hart's Landing? No, but Father Malone at Montville knows a lot about treating the sick. He does it all the time. Well, send someone for him at once. We may be able to bring Nancy and Jimmy around without help, but let's not take any chances. Okay, I'll get a sled off right away. Good. Kent, will they live? Of course they will. I'll get you some warm water and get some, get some milk. All the milk you have. We've got to work fast, Mr. Harmon. Every minute counts. How serious is the condition of Nancy and Jimmy? Were they drugged, as Kent seems to think, or is there another explanation for their mysterious disappearance? And who left them in the log cabin deep in the wood? Don't miss the next episode of Superman if you want the answers. When Nancy Harmon and young Jimmy Olsen seemingly vanished into thin air, Kent, as Superman, found them in a cabin deep in the woods, some miles from the Bartlett logging camp, of which Nancy's father, Fred Harmon, is boss. They appeared to be under the sleep-producing influence of a drug. Rushing them back to the camp, Kent had Bill Dawson, Harmon's right-hand man, send to Montville, the nearest town, for Father Malone, a Northwoods priest who, because of the lack of a physician ministers to the body as well as the soul. It is midnight in the logging camp office. Nancy and Jimmy, although still under the influence of the sleeping potion, seem to be in no danger. Fred Harmon, exhausted by the ordeal, has gone to bed. Kent and Father Malone, a tall, broad-shouldered man with warm gray eyes and a ready smile, are seated before the fire. Well, now, let's see. I've been up in this section of the woods close to 12 years, Mr. Kent. Oh, that's a long time, Father Malone. Oh, not so long. Time passes quickly when there are things to do. Yes, 12 years. My first parish was in St. Clair. That's 10 miles north of Montville. Oh? I, I had seven worshippers, and five of them didn't understand a word of English, and I didn't speak a word of French. <laughs> but we got along famously. 
The moment those Canucks discovered I could handle a rifle, we were friends. <laughs> don't you ever want to go back to a big city? No, no, I, I don't think I'd like it. People are so much more human up here. Mm-hmm. They learn to depend on themselves, and they learn to develop faith in themselves and in providence. Mm. Uh, where did you learn medicine, Father? Books and a few lessons from Dr. Warren at Hart's Landing. Oh. Of course, I never tamper with anything that looks serious. Just odds and ends. Well, you're quite sure Jimmy and Miss Harmon will be all right? Positive. Pulse and respiration are normal. Your diagnosis, I think, was quite correct. Some sort of a sleeping portion. Now, tell me exactly what happened. Well, apparently, Father, it's the White Plague legend again. Okay. Yes, it seems two loggers died very mysteriously a few days ago. And then a third came staggering in out of a blizzard last night and passed away almost in my arms. Then, early today, a fourth man collapsed. Dawson said he'd been struck by a rattler. Oh, no, that's nonsense. Snakes hibernate during the winter. Anything else happened? Yes. Early this afternoon, Jimmy and I were riding back to camp in a horse-drawn sled when someone shot at us from the woods. Shot to kill. I've been waiting for something like that. So? This white plague legend has been haunting me, Kent, ever since I started working among lumberjacks. Like any legend, it passes from mouth to mouth, and the miracles created by it are manifold. But sooner or later, we discover the legend is being put to good or bad use by some misguided human. Mm. So you were shot, Eddie? Yes. Fortunately, neither Jimmy nor I were hit. We got back to camp, and while Mr. Harmon and I were discussing the series of curious accidents, Jimmy and Miss Harmon went out to look at some young raccoons penned up near a shed. Yes, uh, Dawson uh, mentioned that incident to me. Oh? Uh-huh. How you followed their footprints in the snow, and they suddenly stopped. That's right. Did he tell you about the big white bird? Oh, I know. What was that? Well, while Dawson and I were searching for Jimmy and Nancy, we heard two rifle shots. Mm-hmm. We ran back and found that Mr. Harmon had fired at what he claimed was a giant bird. A bird he was certain had carried Nancy and Jimmy off. We found one of the feathers on the snow. As a matter of fact, here it is on the mantel here. Uh, Let me see it. Hmm, Uh, this is very, very curious. Uh, Do you know what bird this feather came from, Mr. Kent? No, I don't, Father. This is one of the large tail quills of a big male turkey, bleached white. A uh, turkey? Yes, that's what it is. I raised them out west when I was a boy, so I should know. This one's been bleached with lime or oxalic acid. The natural color is gray. Mm. Uh, tell me more about this bird, Mr. Kent. Well, there isn't much more I know. Although I could scarcely believe that any bird, even a condor, was strong enough to carry off a human being, the abrupt ending of those footprints in the snow and Mr. Harmon's insistence that he had seen the giant bird made me wonder. Where did you find Nancy and Jimmy? In a cabin about two miles from here. There was a fire going in the stove, so evidently no permanent harm was meant them. They were both unconscious. I brought them back here, and, well, the rest you know. Kent, I'm afraid we're dealing with a clever, unscrupulous individual who must be somewhere in this camp. How do you explain the footprints, Father? I mean, the fact that they ended abruptly and led nowhere. Well, I, I can't at the moment. Neither can I explain the bird Mr. Harmon saw, unless it was simply hysteria. Certainly, Fred Harmon doesn't believe in the white plague now, does he? I'm beginning to wonder. At times, even Dawson seems to be drawn in by it. Of course, once Nancy and Jimmy awake and and were able to tell us what happened, why, then we'll know a great deal more than we do now. I wonder who that could be this time of the night. I'll see. Oh, Dawson, come in. Why, I I thought you'd turned in, Bill. Couldn't sleep, Father. This thing's been preying on my mind. Pull up a chair for yourself. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kent here has been telling me all that's happened, Bill. What do you make of it? Well, right now I'm mixed up, Father. The men will clear out of camp in the morning. They're all scared to death. What are they afraid of? You know, same old story. The white plague. Are you afraid of it, Bill? Who, me? Of course not. I didn't think so. Well, who's leading the men on? Fear always has a leader, you know. Well, no one in particular, unless it's Kirk Travers. He keeps telling them the camp's cursed. We've got to keep the men here, Bill, if only for their own morale. We've got to prove this white plague legend is just that, a legend. You're going to have a tough time, Father, I can tell you. Not if I get your help, Bill. By the way, Bill, do I understand that you said when the loggers was bitten by a rattler? Now you know as well as I do that rattlers haul in for the winter. Uh, it was the first thing I could think of at the moment. I mentioned a heart attack, but that didn't work. Well, how did the man die? He was poisoned, Father. What? Are you sure, Kent? Positive. You didn't say nothing to Mr. Harmon or me about that, Kent. I was keeping it to myself. 
someone around here can't be trusted. Oh, listen, kid, I don't take that kind of trust. Oh, no, 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 sit down, Bill. I'm sure Mr. Kent made no harm. I know. I better watch what he says. You're very sensitive tonight, Dawson. Uh, please, Mr. Kent. I'm sorry, Father. How did you happen to discover the man was poisoned, Mr. Kent? He was sitting on a stump eating lunch when he collapsed. I picked up the remains of the sandwich he dropped when I helped Dawson lift him and carry him to the shed. It was loaded with rat poison, bichloride of mercury. I don't believe it. Whether you believe it or not, I happen to have what's left of the sandwich, and I can produce it at the proper time. Then what all this boils down to is systematic murder. But what possible motive could there be? Wait a minute. The crew's lunch was packed by the crook. Nobody knew Sam Green was going to get that poison sandwich, assuming it was poison. I don't think it was intended for Green. It didn't matter who got it. Oh, sounds fishy to me. Don't it to you, Father? Not if the man who poisoned it was out to create terror and fear of the White Plague, which seems to be the case. But then why did he try to get rid of Jimmy and myself? Certainly we played no part in the scheme of things. Unless... Unless what, Mr. Kent? Well, I may be all wet on this, but... Could it be that the person who tried to kill us doesn't believe that Jimmy and I came here to the camp just for a vacation? Is it possible he thinks I'm spying on him? That presupposes he has something to hide. Wait a minute. thought I heard someone moving around in the back room. Jimmy or Nancy might have regained consciousness. No, no, I guess not. Who would have anything to hide in a backwoods logging camp? It might be a crime committed some time ago. I can see this ain't getting nowhere. Yes, I'll turn in. Good night, Father. Good night, Bill. I trust you can sleep. Good night, Dawson. Good night. I don't like his attitude. Not a bit. Ah, oh, Bill Dawson's all right. Little crude and little gruff, but harmless. You mustn't look for the polish of civilization in these woods, King. There isn't time to acquire it. Men of the North Country spend most of their working hours either fighting for existence or battling nature. Either way, they have a fight on their hands. So do city people. I assure you, life isn't any bed of roses for the unfortunate families who have to live in slum areas. Ah, there you're right. But the problem up here is slightly different. Now, you work at the desk back at your newspaper office, don't you? Yes. Well, chances are you never stop to think of the sweat and blood that went into getting the wood for that desk. First, the superhuman labor of felling the tree with a thermometer at 30 degrees below zero. And then carting it to the river in the face of a blinding blizzard. Then pouring it 50 miles downstream... Where a misstep means horrible death. All for a desk or a chair or a pencil. These men who do that work face destruction every minute of the day. And all they have to guard against it is their wits and their brawn. You can't expect any social grace. Oh, I, I don't, Father Malone. That, that wasn't my point. It's just that Dawson's been acting strange through all this misfortune. I, I, I can't quite understand it. Well, I, I had that same trouble when I first arrived here, but I learned fast. They don't talk unless they have something to say. And they've never seen anything accomplished by talking. It takes two brawny arms and a sharp-bladed axe to fell a tree, not just words. Understand? I think so. Ah, uh, but <laughs> you mustn't let me go on like this. You... Now, now, you were saying that, that Bill's actions have been strange. Wait a minute. I thought I heard a voice. Yeah. Oh, wait, you did. You did someone shout and fire. Look, Look one of the cabins is blazing. Come on, Father. Right behind you, Kent. Look at those flames. Say, you can feel the heat from here. It's terrific. Those dry pine logs go up like kinder. I wonder whether anyone's in that cabin. No, we'll find out. Hey! Is there anyone inside? Yes! Kirk Travers! He can't get out! He's trapped! Kirk Travers! Trapped! We've got to take him! Roaring, devastating fire. The woodsman's one deadly fear. Will Kent, even as Superman, be able to save Kurt Travers from the blazing inferno of his log cabin? And can the fire be kept from spreading into the forest beyond the camp? Tune in again for more thrills. Don't forget, tune in again for the next thrilling episode with Superman. As you remember, Jimmy Olsen and Nancy Harmon, missing from the Bartlett logging camp for hours, were found in a cabin deep in the woods, both of them unconscious from a sleeping potion. Father Malone, a strapping Northwoods priest, Summoned from the nearest town because of his widespread fame as a minister to the body as well as the soul, has decided that neither Jimmy nor Nancy will suffer any ill effects after the potion has worn off. But in the meantime, while Kent and Father Malone are talking in the camp office, a fire breaks out in one of the loggers' cabins. A roaring inferno in which a helpless man is trapped. 
Are you sure there's someone in that cabin? Yes, Kirk Travers. Kirk Travers? He can't get out. They'll never quench that fire with water again. I'm afraid not, Father. It's too far gone. Hey, what are you doing? Taking off my coat. I'm going in for that man. No, you're not. I can't even let her die like a caged uh, animal. Father, let go of me, Kent. You'll never get through that wall of flame, Father Malone. Now, do it, Father. Listen to me. You stay here. If the fire shifts, you may be able to get to him through that window. I'll go around to the other side. We'll get him out if it's humanly possible. All right, Kent. Good luck for you, well, it's not humanly possible, but it is possible for Superman. There's only one difficulty. I can't afford to have anyone see me. No time to worry about that now. I'll have to chance it. Now, this is where the door must be. All right, here goes. There, I'm inside. I don't think I was seen. Now to find Travers and haul him out. Great. Scott, this fire hasn't missed an inch of the cabin. It's burning like all fury. Travers! Travers! Oh, there he is. Doubled up in a corner with the flames playing all around him. His clothes are on fire. Beat these flames out with my hands. There. Hope I'm not too late. Poor fellow's horror will be burned. Well, out we go, right through the thick of it. Ah, does it. I came through there so fast, I don't think the flames got to him again. Now to assume Clark Kent's roll. Father Malone! Oh, in the Oh, thank heavens, you got him out. Yes, the door collapsed, and there he was. But he's badly burned. We'd better get him to Mr. Harmon's cabin. Uh, can I help you? No, I'll carry him. You lead the way. Let me have that ointment, Dawson. Yes? Yes. Is that saline solution ready, Kent? I have it right here. Completely dissolved? Yes. Do you know how to fill a hypodermic syringe? I think so. You'll find one in my bag, wrapped in sterile gauze. Fill it with the salt solution, but hurry. All right. How does it look, Father? Uh, not too good, Bill. Most of his burns are third degree, and they're bad. Ready with that hypo, Kent? In a minute. Here it is. Good. Now. Turn his left arm around. Palm up. Palm up, yeah. Careful. That's it. Yeah. Now, hold it steady. I got it. There. I'll fill the hypo again, Kenny. All right. How did the fire start, Bill? Nobody knows. When I left here, I walked over to my cabin. The minute I got inside, I heard someone yell. It couldn't have flared up like that in less than a minute. Hypo's ready, Father Malone. Now, thank you. Now, hold his arm... Gently. All right. It's enough for the time being, anyhow. Now all we can do is hope and pray. I've done everything I can, spiritually and physically. Uh, cover him up with that blanket. All right, Father. There we are. There. Now I'm going out to look at what's left of the cabin. I'll be right back. We'll come with you, Ken. Oh, all right. You say you didn't see any fire when you passed Travers Cabin on the way to your own, Bill? No, I didn't. That's impossible. I told you I didn't see no fire, Ken. And I tell you it's impossible. Why, you dirty... Look it out, both of you. He can't call me no liar and get away with it. I'll bust him in two. Put your hands up, Kent. You're going to get the thrashing of your life. I'm ready. I'll put the terror to both of you unless you stop this nonsense. And don't think I can't do it. No man calls me a liar. I don't care who he is. If that's the worst you ever called, Dawson, you're lucky. Now, come on. And don't try anything either of you. Now, let's fly with the right course of only a boxing championship at college. Come on. Yeah. I ain't through with him yet. Not by a long shot. Well, here's what's left of the cabin. Nothing but a few pieces of charred pine and an iron cart. Yeah, that fire must have been burning for a good ten minutes before we heard the logger shout. I tell you, it wasn't burning when I went by. Now, hold your temper, Bill. I'm inclined to agree with Kent. He couldn't possibly have gotten that far and done so much damage. Wait a minute. Smell this piece of wood, Father. Kent. It smells like kerosene. That's what it is. I may have to apologize, Dawson. If the cabin was saturated with kerosene, it might very well have gone up in less than a minute. I didn't see no fire. Yeah, this piece of wood has kerosene on it, too. That's what happened, Father. Someone spilled kerosene around the cabin and then touched a match to it. Well, that hardly sounds possible, Kent. Dawson, was Travers alone in the cabin? Yeah. Preston used to bunk with him, but he was the one who disappeared and then came back to die before he could talk. Travers was afraid he was going to be next. He said so, and Sam Green went. He and Sam worked on the last tree we felled this morning. Ah, don't talk nonsense, Bill. This isn't any ridiculous legend. This is cold-blooded murder. 
We'd, we'd better get the sheriff. He should have been called in a long time ago. Send one of your men to town, Bill. Hey, wait a minute. Someone's coming over. Now, Mr. Dawson. What is it, Charlie? The men are all set to hike into Moby. They say they ain't spending another night here. Thought I'd better tell you. Uh, oh, wait. Let me talk to them. Uh, where are they, Charlie? Won't do no good, Father. Hank and Chris swear they saw a guy with wings go into the burning cabin after Kurt Travers. They don't want no part of this camp. A man with wings? Well, they're out of their mind. I, I think I can handle them. Uh, you and Dawson go back to the office, Kent, and keep an eye on Travers. All right, Charlie. Now take me over to the I'm sorry I went overboard, Dawson. You won't hold it against me, will you? Forget it. Thanks. Well, come on. What do you make of this now, Dawson? It don't make sense. I'm beginning to feel like the men. White plague or no white plague, I want to get out. I don't like it. Hank Bechet and Chris Dunham say they saw a man with wings go in after Travers. There are no blind fools. Can't they saw something? Well, they probably saw me pulling Travers out of the doorway. Well, maybe. Oh, Mr. Harmon's up. Hello. Kent. Kent, what happened? Why is Kurt Travers lying there? One of the cabins caught fire and burned down. Travers was trapped inside. Dawson, is that true? Yes. Didn't you hear nothing? Not a sound. I woke up suddenly and walked out here and saw Travers stretched out on the couch. What is a ghost? Is he... Father Malone tried to save him. We can't be sure yet. Right now, he looks... Dawson. He passed away. How do you know? No pulse, no respiration. He's gone. Well, this is ghastly. When will it stop? What's that puddle near the couch? Snow melting off Mr. Harmon's shoes. Want me to get Father Malone, Kent? No, it's too late now. Draw the blanket up. That makes five, don't it? Yeah. Five men murdered. No. Not murdered. No, it can't be. I'm afraid that's what it is, Mr. Harmon. Dawson, did you wire Mr. Bartlett? Did you tell him we were closing up? Haven't had a chance. Haven't had a... It don't matter. The men are quitting, all of them. I don't blame them. I'm going myself. This is too much. Where's Nancy? She and Jimmy are still sleeping off the effects of the drug. I'll look in on them. You don't blame me, Bill, do you? You don't blame me for closing the camp? No, I don't blame you. I've had enough of it myself. That cabin going up in flames was the last straw. How did it start? Kerosene. You mean? Someone poured kerosene all over it. Someone who wanted to get rid of Kirk Travers. Jimmy and Nancy are all right. Where's Father Malone? Talking to your men, trying to convince them to stay. No, I don't want him to. Let them go. Why, Mr. Harmon? I can't keep them here any longer. Their lives are in danger. Let them go. We've all got to get out. It's as soon as possible. Oh, here's Father Malone now. Well, the men agreed to stay. What's the matter, Kent? Oh, Mr. Harmon's up. Travers is dead, Father. No. At least he felt no pain. For that, we give thanks. Father Malone, I don't want the men to remain in camp. I'm closing it up. Uh, you, you can't do that, Mr. Harmon. I won't permit it. Well, what do you mean? Well, you won't let these men become the victims of stupid, senseless fear. If they leave, it must be with a conviction that human hands wreaked this havoc. That a twisted human brain created this madness. And further, whoever has been responsible for this must be brought to justice. Well, I've had enough, I tell you. I can't stand any more of it. Can't watch him. Easy there, Mr. Harmon. Here, take my hand. You better sit down. I'm sorry. Forgive me. That's all right. We understand. Kent, you and Dawson carry poor Travers into one of the back rooms. All right, I, I've asked all the men to come here. We're, we're going to get to the bottom of this before dawn. All right, Kent. Take a seat. Easy. Ah, you must get a grip on yourself, Mr. Harmon. You can't show the men that you've been affected. All right, I'll try. I'll do my best. That's the way to talk. Father Malone. Yes, Kent? I don't think it will be necessary to have the men here. Well, why not? It's the only way to question everyone at once. I don't think you'll have to question anyone. Well, what do you mean? I know who killed those five loggers. I know who set fire to the cabin. I know who's responsible for everything that's happened. And I can prove it. Well, Clark Kent certainly seems sure of himself, doesn't he? Do you know who used the legend of the White Plague to cast an evil spell of mystery over the Bartlett logging camp? 
Then tune in on the next episode of Superman for a startling solution. Don't forget, tune in again for the next thrilling episode with Superman. Faced with the problem of clearing up the mystery surrounding the Bartlett logging camp, Father Malone, a strapping Northwoods priest, has taken matters into his own hands. He has asked all the terrified lumberjacks to meet him in the camp office, where, once and for all, he intends to expose the legend of the White Plague, said to be responsible for all that has happened. But before the lumberjacks arrive, Clark Kent, present in the office, together with Fred Harmon, manager of the camp, and Bill Dawson's logging boss, makes a startling statement. Listen. What was that you said, Kent? I said I don't think it'll be necessary to question the men, Father Malone. Well, it's the only way we'll ever get to the bottom of this. I think we're at the bottom now. Well, what do you mean? I know who was responsible for using the legend of the White Plague to terrify the camp. I know who murdered the five lumberjacks. Well, Kent, do you know what you're saying? I don't make statements, Mr. Harmon, unless I'm quite sure of myself. Well, if, if you knew all this, Kent, why didn't you tell us a long time ago? I wasn't certain a long time ago, Father. I am now. I'd better tell the men not to come. You stay right where you are, Dawson. The men might be very interested in hearing what I have to say. No, Dawson's right, Kent. If you mean what you said, if you actually know who's been responsible for all this, we'd best not tell the men, not just yet. In their fury, they'd tear him to pieces. Go ahead, Bill. Ask him to wait a few minutes. Okay. Well, who is it, Kent? And why did he take the lives of five good men? I think we'd better wait until Dawson comes back, Father. Kent, are you sure you know what you're talking about? Are you sure you're not about to accuse a man of crimes he hasn't committed? Don't worry, Mr. Harmon. No one will be accused falsely. All right, here's Dawson. Banner's sitting on powder kegs. Any minute now, they're going to blow sky high and there'll be no holding them. Go ahead, Kent. You see, we haven't much time. Who was responsible for this crime against heaven and earth? Well, telling you isn't as easy as all that, Father. I'll have to go back and trace what happened step by step. You'd better sit down, all of you. It may be a long story. We'd best cut it short, Kent. You heard what Dawson said about the men. I'll try. Now, all of you know how Jimmy Olsen and I happened to be here. We were invited to spend a vacation at the camp. That's so, isn't it, Mr. Harmon? Oh, yes, of course. Mr. Bartlett wired that you were coming. That's right, and you wired back telling us not to come because of trouble. However, Jimmy and I weren't notified until our train was pulling into Montville. We decided to pay the camp a visit and return to Metropolis the following day. We've been here since. Is all that necessary, Kent? I'm afraid so, Father, because it proves that Jimmy and I were responsible for everything that's happened at this logging camp. Kent, are you mad? Have you lost your mind? This ain't no time for joking, Kent. I'm not out of my mind, Father, and it isn't a joke, Dawson. As much as I hate to tell you this, I'm convinced that if Jimmy and I had gone back to Metropolis without visiting the camp, everything would have been all right. Uh, you're talking through your hat, Kent. Two men were found dead before you ever set foot in the camp. I realize that. Those men lost their lives only because someone here knew I was on my way. I'm frank to admit that I, I don't follow this, Kent. It just doesn't make sense. Come to the point, man. Now, this is the point. The person responsible for all that has happened thought I had been sent up here by Mr. Bartlett to spy on him. He had a guilty conscience because of something he had done, something he had to hide at any cost. And you mean to say, Kent, that, that he took the lives of five men to hide that something? Yes. He used the legend of the White Plague to throw fear into the camp. Hoping, probably, that the loggers would quit. The camp would be disbanded and there'd be no knowledge of this crime. Who was this fiend in human form, Kent? I'm coming to that, Father. In the first place, I'd like to say that this man did not work alone. He had a partner. A partner who suffered the same fate as the others because he knew too much. You mean he was one of the five? Yes. He was Kurt Travers. Travers? I don't believe it. Just because the man is dead and can't answer the charge... He won't have to answer it, Mr. Harmon. His partner is alive. He'll answer for Kurt Travers. Dawson. Huh? Yes? You remember what happened when Gaston the French-Canadian disappeared? You told me about it. Uh, I'm sure I remember. Mr. Harmon and me were sitting in this room talking about the White Plague when we heard a scream. We ran out in a raging blizzard to see what had happened. Gaston was gone. We couldn't find him nowhere. Who told you it was Gaston who had screamed? Kurt Travers. The Canuck bunked in the same cabin with Travers. That's right. It was Travers who told you Gaston had screamed and Travers who said he'd vanished. Well, I don't see that you're getting very far, Kent. What are you trying to prove? Simply that Travers lied. It wasn't Gaston who screamed. Gaston was too far away from the camp by that time. It was Travers. How do you know all this, Kent? Well, what I've just told you is guesswork. That's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid it's all guesswork. We can't pass a murder on a man because someone imagines he's guilty. The rest isn't imagination, Mr. Harmon. It's cold fact. The next thing that happened after Gaston escaped from wherever he was being held and staggered back through the blizzard only to die before he could talk 
was Sam Green's sudden collapse. You all remember that. Well, Kent, this isn't new to any of us. I know it isn't, Father, but every step must be traced. All right, go ahead. Well, Sam Green, as I told you once before, was poisoned. Can you prove it? Yes. I have the poisoned sandwich he was eating when he keeled over. As a matter of fact, someone saw me pick that sandwich up out of the snow. One of your crew, Dawson. Who was it? Kurt Travers. He got frightened when he realized I had the evidence, and while you were giving Jimmy and myself instructions on how to drive the sled to camp, he sneaked off through the woods with a rifle and tried to get rid of us. I'm sorry to have to do this constantly, Kent, but that's something you can't prove either. Oh, yes, I can. You remember my telling you that rifle had been fired recently, Mr. Harmon? Yes, but Olaf the Swede said it hadn't been fired at all. I know, but Olaf and I were talking about different rifles. He wasn't with Dawson's crew that morning. I checked on that. The rifle he returned hadn't been shot, but the one I picked out of the corner had been. But you're not certain Travers fired it, Kent. Well, if you mean I have no eyewitness, Father, you're quite right, but let me finish. After the shooting incident, Nancy Harmon and young Jimmy disappeared. We traced their footprints in the snow, and they ended abruptly, as though someone or something had snatched them both up into the air. It was puzzling and mysterious, just as it was intended to be. Things were getting a little too warm for the guilty person, and he and his partner decided to use the mysterious disappearance of Nancy and Jimmy to break up the camp. Well, that still doesn't explain how they disappeared, Kent. Yes, I myself saw their footprints in the snow. They, they just stopped short. Would you like me to tell you how that was done? It's an old trick. How was it done, Kent? With two pairs of shoes, one belonging to Nancy, the other to Jimmy. Really? I don't know whether any of you ever noticed, but Kurt Travers had very small feet. As a matter of fact, he and Jimmy wore the same size shoe. It was a simple matter for him to create those footprints and then back up on them. Kent, I I must say this is all a little hard to believe. Yes, I'm afraid so. Now, Mr. Harmon, you remember when we discovered the footprints, Dawson and I went on to the pine woods while you returned to camp to search the cabins? Yes, I remember. Well, just as Dawson and I were about to enter the woods, we heard shots. We rushed back, and you had been shooting at what you thought was a giant bird. I didn't have to think, Kent. I saw it with my own eyes. That's one thing I'm sure of. Well, you failed to hit the bird, but one of its feathers came floating down. You found it. That's right. I showed you the feather, Father Malone. What did you tell me it was? A tail quill from a large turkey, bleached white. But that's impossible. Nothing is impossible, Mr. Harmon. I got a question I'd like to ask, Kent, if you don't mind. Not at all, Dawson. All this you've been telling us sounds mighty good. There's one thing don't sit right. What is it? Why didn't this guy you're talking about, whoever he is, get rid of Nancy and the boy instead of leaving him in a shack in the woods with a fire going in the stove? If, like you say, he killed five men, why'd he take such good care of them two? That's a very sensible question, Dawson, and I'm glad you asked it. I'll tell you why. For this reason. Although this man we're talking about was desperate, he wasn't desperate enough to take the life of his own daughter. What? Are you mad? Are you accusing me of... do you know what you've said? I know exactly, Father. Yes, Mr. Harmon. I'm accusing you of being responsible for everything that has happened in this camp. But the man's insane. He's out of his mind. It's a serious charge you've made, Kent. I realize that, Father, and I can prove it. Less than an hour ago, a cabin went up in flames. We know it had been saturated with kerosene and set afire. It was done to get rid of Travers because Mr. Harmon here was afraid we were on his trail and he couldn't run the risk of Travers talking. That's a lie. Father Malone, I demand Just a minute. Do you deny that you set fire to that cabin, Harmon? Of course I deny it. I was asleep through it all. I heard nothing until you and Dawson came into this office. That's what you told us. Bill, you're going to let this madman accuse me of murder without doing something about it? What makes you think Mr. Harmon set that cabin afire, Kent? I don't have to think, Dawson, I know. Now try and remember what happened when we walked into this office after we discovered how the fire started. Kurt Travers was stretched out on that couch, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Harmon was standing over there, looking dazed. He asked us what had happened, and we told him. I stepped over to the couch to look at Travers and found he had passed away. Now, do you remember my asking you, Dawson, about a little puddle of water on the floor near the couch? Yes. Snow melting off Mr. Harmon's shoes. Exactly. Snow melting off Mr. Harmon's shoes. He had been outside, walking through the snow, pouring kerosene around Travers' cabin, setting it on fire. Dawson, grab that rifle. Too late. Stand back, all of you. Put that gun down, Fred. Not on your leg. Now stand back. I'll send a bullet through the first man that moves. You're making a big mistake, Harmon. This won't get you anywhere. I know where it'll get me. You're a pretty smart guy, Kent. But I'm one step ahead of you. I knew you were one of Bartlett's spies. I knew it. That's where you're wrong, Harmon. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Who do you think you're kidding? Not me. I know what Bartlett sent you up here for to check my accounts. Well, go ahead and check them. You'll find the company short the money for 30,000 feet of lumber, maybe more. I stole it, Kent. Tell that to Bartlett. 
I stole it to get it up to bring my daughter up like a lady to take her out of Logan camps. Now are you satisfied? Give me that rifle, Fred. Oh, no. Not even for you, Father. Think of Nancy, Fred. I've been thinking of her. That's what got me into this. Keep back, Father. I'm warning you. Look out. He'll shoot. Fred, I'm going to walk right up to you. And you're going to give me that rifle. Keep back. Keep back. Trapped in a maze of evidence that forced him to admit his guilt, Fred Harmon stands with his back against the wall as Father Malone, the Northwoods priest, slowly approaches him. Suddenly, the rifle in Harmon's hand thunders its message of death, and three men stare in shocked amazement. Something unexpected has happened. What is it? Listen to the next episode of Superman. Don't forget, tune in again for the next thrilling episode with Superman. Look! Up in the sky! It's a bird! It's a plane! It's Superman! Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Action Comics magazine.